Welcome to the Green Lectionary Podcast, a production of Creation Justice Ministries. The Green Lectionary is a conversation on scripture through the lens of creation justice. My name is Derek Weston, and today we will be looking at a text for the third week of the season of creation. For those who are unfamiliar, the season of creation is a five-week period stretching from the beginning of September to the beginning of October, in which we make time to renew our relationship with our Creator and all creation for celebration, conversation, and commitment together. My guests today are Reverend Dr. David Lattimore, Director of the Betsy Stockton Center for Black Studies at Princeton Theological Seminary, and Dr. Ellen Davis, Professor of Bible and Practical Theology at Duke Divinity School. Join us now as we look at James chapter 3 through the lens of creation justice. And our text for this week uh, is from James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will face stricter judgment. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is mature, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of life, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed, and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes a a blessing and a cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. So, where is creation in this passage? Everywhere. Would you like to say more? (laughs) Yeah. So, um, when I first looked at it, and I have not looked at it as deeply as I would like to, but when I first looked at it, I thought, well, Um, the non-human world is, it's a source of imagery of metaphors, and that's, that's true. Um, but as I'm looking at it now, it seems to me that the non-human world is, is the world in which the body in question mm. is immersed. Mm. Um, and so I'm looking at the phrase um, setting on fire. Your translation, what did your translation mm. have? And in verse six, setting on fire. Yeah. Cycle of nature. Sets on, sets on fire the cycle of life. Um, what, what does your translation say? So my, so my translation has the cycle of nature. Mm. Um, and I'm looking at the Greek and my Greek is not my best language, but it's Geneseos. Um, and which I believe is Genesis. Um, Mm. and so it's, the tongue is setting on fire the entirety of creation, it would seem to say. That's a pretty strong statement. Mm. Mm. And, and uh, what two observations leaped out to me, the first of which is as you go through this pericope, it talks about the tongue and its consequence for those with whom you are in community, the great harm that it can do 
to others. And, and that, to me, begs the question, so how is it that we're defining community? Uh, and so often, we're very human focused. Um, but it, it does pr prompt us to consider, so what might be the other members of community for whom this metaphorical tongue can do some harm to? Mm. I'm particularly struck by the fact that the three metaphors that are used for the tongue all include different elements of the world around us. So you use the metaphor of the bridle in the horse's uh, mouth, the metaphor of the rudder of the ship, the metaphor of fire, and all of those seem to me to suggest a broader understanding of both community and how we understand ourselves as a part of it, whether it is the animal uh, kingdom as a part of the creation through the first metaphor, whether it is nature itself through the second metaphor, or whether it's the very elements and the, the use of fire. So I think the, the text does invite us to express some theological imagination and to deal with not just the human element of our community, but also the other parts of community that sometimes go gets overlooked or ignored in our engagement with biblical texts. Mm. I'm I'm really um, drawn by this idea that um, a lot of the ways that creation shows up in this passage is subject to humanity mm -hmm. and specifically subject to the tongue, like specifically subject to our words. Um, Dr. Lattimore, as you were su suggesting that that our words and that the tongue has um, an effect on the more than human world, that 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 there is a um, but not just not just an effect, a a, a negative effect um, and, and a, a, a dangerous effect on on the non-human world um that seems to come up over and over again throughout this passage the ways in which humanity has um has tamed uh the species of the world and that our 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 tongues can set you know <laughs> the entirety of creation by your by your your reading of that translation dr davis the entirety of creation on fire um creation seems to be very much in peril imperiled by humanity in this passage and yes and there's a tension uh i'm looking at verses seven and eight we think of taming as a protective gesture mm. <laughs> in general, um, that one cares for the creature one has tamed. Um, and But verse 8 suggests, and certainly in the ancient world, people people's lives depended upon the animals they domesticated and they lived mm. in the same household with them. Um, and uh, not as pets, but as one might say, working members of the household. Mm. Um, so, you know, thinking about the mutual dependency, one might say, of mm. the, the humans and the creatures that they tame. Um, and then there is this acute irony that the tongue is um, is poisonous. <laughs> and so spread, one might say, spreading, it's a restless evil. What a what a phrase. <laughs> that, it, <laughs> that it's spreading poison through the household so to speak, the, in, in Greek, the oikonomos, the, the, um, the ordering of the household is poisoned by the tongue. And the oikonomos, of course, from that comes our word economy. Mm. economy. Mm. You know what, what uh, I am struck by 
is the, um, maybe contrast is not the right word, but the variance in how the tongue is pictured in this text. Mm -hmm. There are places in the text where it seems to be clearly saying that the tongue is fundamentally evil. And yet we also have the language of blessings coming mm -hmm. from the tongue as well as cursing. So uh, one element that leaps out to me is that uh, uh, the writer is suggesting a couple of different ways of looking at the tongue. Uh, and, and I can't help but, um, uh, you know, be drawn to the notions of, okay, if the tongue is evil, this does line up with some constructions of Christian theology, uh, and I'm thinking Reformed theology in particular, that has a, a idea of uh, humanity as fundamentally flawed. Uh, and so that whatever we do out, outside of some intervention by God is going to always be drawn to the most destructive uh, tendencies of human existence. Uh, and, and so what that seems to suggest for me, if I look at the, how does this apply to uh, environmental concerns? It robs us of the idea that somehow all of us can, all of us might not, might be culpable in mm. some of the harm that's done to our community, that none of us have the luxury of assuming our simply beneficial relationship uh, with the lands, because like the tongue, we can be products of both good and evil um, in our engagement. So I think one of the things that leaped out to me was this removes any sense of conceit, any sense of this doesn't apply to me, I ought not consider this, just as I have to consider how the tongue is used in life, I should also consider what are the other ways in which our actions and our practices might themselves be harmful uh, to the world around us. And the flip side of that is, and also to recognize the potential good that can be done. What, what, what was wonderful about this text was it focuses on one of the smallest organs and to say the potential for both good and for evil. And, and if I again apply that to my consideration of the environment, it suggests not only might I be capable of doing great harm in what are seemingly innocuous ways, but it also suggests the great good I can do, even if my gestures are small, mm -hmm. even if they seem inconsequential relative to context, even something this small as the tongue or the life or your gestures can have outsized impact for good and for evil. So it invests within me some sense of my own agency while also warning me uh, to, to not be arrogant to think that I, I ought not be diligent mm. in this area of life. And I think there's great preaching potential um, mm. with that. Mm. As you're speaking, um, I'm thinking about the fact that one could see the tongue and the body as referring to an individual, but one could also apply those in a more corporate sense. Mm. That thinking about, I mean, you, you began Dr. Lattimore with the question, what is the community here? So if the community is the body, if the church is the body in question, or even the, the body politic, mm. um, then the tongue is not just the organ in the individual mouth, mm -hmm. but it is the public articulation of curses and blessing, mm. which of course is infinitely mag magnified um, by all of the media that we now have for um, spreading our voices. And then also something that came to me as you, as you were speaking, Dr. Lattimore, is when you were speaking about the blessing and the cursing, um, those final images that we've not spoken so much about in 11 and 12, does a spring pour forth from the same opening fresh water and brackish? Brackish? No. Can a fig tree, my brethren, yield olives 
or a grapevine figs, no more can salt water yield fresh. All of those examples suggest there's something profoundly unnatural about speaking blessing and cursing mm. from the same body. Hmm. Which I, I find that a striking idea, that hmm. there is something contrary to nature, even it's not only a matter of bad behavior or you know something I need to discipline, it is that, but there's something fundamentally incongruent, unnatural hmm. about, as we sometimes say, speaking out of two sides of your mouth. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very much so. Very much so. The, the conclusion of this particular passage uh, reminds me that at least within the African-American tradition, although I don't think it's limited to that in any way, uh, there has always been this great um, concern or interest in the alignment of profession with practice, right? The, uh, if we say we believe this, then how is it then embodied in our actions? Uh, and the conclusion of this resonates with that uh, particular perspective and begs the question of us, okay, well, if we consider uh, that we are stewards of the earth, uh, then one must ask oneself, to what degree do our practices support that profession? Mm -hmm. uh, do we see evidence of that in our lifestyles as a corporate uh, and in and, and corporate, I'm thinking of the church as an entity or within the family or within the individual life. So uh, what I'm struck by is if you were to ask a hundred pastors, how many of them believe that uh, we have some obligation to care for the world? I think generally you probably get a pretty high affirmation of that thought. Uh, but I wonder if you then go the next step that this text is suggesting and say, well, if we were to examine the actual practices that you or your church or your community engage in, how do those practices demonstrate that you truly believe or hold on to these beliefs? And, and that, uh, again, particularly within African-American tradition, that's, the, that's a $64,000 question. <laughs> Not simply the profession, but to what degree do our practices line up with our commitment to being good stewards of the earth. And that presents for us also just the opportunity. Here are the places where we can be more attentive to ensure that what we say we believe, uh, we actually do follow up in the life that we live in community. Hmm. I, I wanna just, before I move on to the next question, I wanna draw attention to one more thing. Um, it seems to me that in some ways, the primary uh, role of creation in this passage is as teacher, um, which I find kind of humorous because the way that the passage begins is not many of you should become teachers. Um, and having two academics here, I thought, you know, this is really, this is really interesting. Uh, the idea that we should maybe in some ways back off of our teaching um, and instead maybe let ourselves be more informed by what we see and observe in the created world around us. Because um, clearly uh, the writer of James saw creation as teacher, um, rife, rife with metaphor, but also uh, rife with instruction. So what is the, um, how does the passage suggest that we should interact with creation? Well, what you've just said suggests uh, that our first role should be to observe. Hmm. Um, I'm thinking of Genesis 2.15, and the Lord God took the human being and set him slash them in the garden of Da'u L'Shomcha to um, 
to work it and to keep it. But you could also translate that to serve it and to observe it. Mm. Um, which suggests that the first mode of service, so to speak, is to notice what's happening around mm. you. Um, and so I, I think that's a really good observation that um, that in the mode of wisdom literature in the Bible, and, and James does speak very much in that mode, that one pays attention to what nature has to teach us. Mm. Um, it is as... Wes Jackson, an important um, ecological thinker in our time, speaks of lang of nature as model, as measure. Um, you know, what does what does creation show us can be done? Model, mentor, and measure. That's what mm. he, those are the mm. three that he uses, and I think that. Something something of that is suggested here. Mm. Mm. I, I will I will acknowledge I am uh, what I what I enjoy about both this conversation and our prior ones as it relates to environmental concerns are, are all the ways it constantly demonstrates to me my proclivity to read the text through the lens of humanity uh, and to not the opportunity to be far more focused on the multitude of places where the environment is not just brought into conversation, but instrumental to our understanding of ourselves and the world around us. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I will acknowledge that I, I did not see the very observation that you've just made, that it may be what it is inviting us is to learn from, to observe, to encounter uh, the earth, that uh, we might have a better understanding of ourselves in community with the environment. And, and even as I say that, what I'm quickly reminded is one of the roles in the one of the ways in which Christian leadership is thought of, uh, and particularly pastors are thought of, or those who pass on what they've learned from others, right? Mm -hmm. So if the environment is indeed instructor for me, then the question becomes, to what degree am I passing on what I've learned? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and both in ways positive, but as well as what does my silence on these issues also mean for my community? And again, I'm, I'm brought back to the uh, African-American church where we've not had lots of conversations around the responsibility, opportunities, and obligations we have to the world around us. Mm -hmm. And so as I listen to this opening text, uh, uh, be, not being cautious around being a teacher and yet sitting and studying the environment to what degree, both through the words that I share, the practices I engage in, or the silence that I have, mm -hmm. bring me into some concern and some question as it relates to my role as a, a potential pastor or leader of a congregation. So again, I, I, am, I'm, I welcome the observation that you've made, and it prompts me to say again, one of the great opportunities for certainly all churches, but, but certainly those with whom I'm most familiar is, we, we have an obligation to learn from and then to share with those with whom we're in community with the benefits, the strengths, the blessings, the opportunities to engage the world around us that God has so graciously put into our care in more effective and more meaningful, more meaningful ways. Mm. Mm. And Dr. Lattimore, to go back to your emphasis earlier on practices and the discussion about the tongue, does this suggest then that one of the first obligations within the church is to preach and teach on this issue? Um, I'm, I have just begun a course this term with my colleague, Jerusha Neal, on preaching in view of climate change, mm. uh, preaching biblically in view of climate change. And that group of students from 
both black students and mm -hmm. uh, and white students, I would say um, almost almost everybody in the class comes, I think only one person of the 20 odd people in the class uh, this term says, I come from a church that's really talking about this issue. Mm. Mm -hmm. a absolutely, absolutely. One of the uh, one of the great tragedies, uh, one of the great tragedies that uh, I, I believe we, we will have to acknowledge at some point is the ways in which our silence on these topics. And when I say silence, I don't, don't simply mean our rhetorical silence, but also the silence of our actions. Mm -hmm. To what degree do they stand in some measure, and I'm going to use the language of condemnation, there's probably a better word, but to what degree does our silence can make a, a, a statement against our faithfulness in certain areas? And I think you're absolutely right. We don't, we don't have nearly enough of the kinds of conversations within the communities that I've been um, uh, blessed to be a part of about these important issues around the environment. And so it, it, it seems to suggest that the text overall Hey, we're 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 talking about the tongue, and certainly there are some specific lessons we can learn about our language. But if I take again the tongue as a bit of a metaphor for the expression of desire and intent, it is also suggesting both the potential good and the potential harm that can come from my expressions of intent as it relates to the world around me, uh, and so that both our silence and our our actions both carry consequences and, and require some degree of um, consideration, evaluation uh, of the degree to which they, they live up to our beliefs and our beliefs, not as relates simply to individual benefit, but our beliefs as it relates to communal impact. Uh, and that's where, again, I think the environment comes directly into consideration uh, because I don't think James is, I, I, I don't wanna put words in James's mouth, but I think James does invite me to consider a broader definition of community and consequence. So in light of those things, where is there a call to action for the church um, in this passage? I'm going to begin at least answering that or responding to that not just by looking at the passage, but actually by looking at the fact of our looking at the passage, <laughs> if I may. Um, and so when you asked us to look at James and I looked at it a little too late last evening and I thought at first, well, there's nothing here. <laughs> and, and I've been working on reading scripture through the eyes of attention to creation for 30 years. But my first response is, well, there's really nothing here. <laughs> um, which just goes to show I haven't learned a whole lot from teaching this for 30 years. <laughs> but, um, but I... I think what it points to is something I say all the time, and that is that scripture was written by people who lived very close to the, what we call the natural world, what the biblical mm -hmm. writers generally call the work of God's hands. They did not live in an industrialized society. Um, and so we have to acquire a new set of eyes, a new set of sensibilities. And just the fact of you're asking us to look at this passage, which I would not have picked. And then I had to look at it more carefully. And we've been talking for half an hour and uh, seem to be having a reasonably fruitful conversation. Just to so. the fact that we need to learn and keep learning to read in another dimension than we normally do. Mm -hmm. And to recognize that by virtue of 
the society in which we have all come of age, or in my case, aged, that we have, we are deprived of a fundamental ability to read the world mm. that the biblical writers are assuming. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, again, let me acknowledge my own confession. Uh, this was a reminder that there are there are lessons and understandings um, that can be gained when we begin to consider how these texts talk about our practices and how those practices have consequence for our community, inclusive of our stewardship uh, of the earth and the world around us and, and, and all of the members of community. And I think this text is filled with calls to action, particularly considering that you know, this is the, the same letter that admonishes us not to be doers of the world, world word, uh, but or to be doers of the world and not to be hearers of it uh, mm -hmm. only. So, so already we're encountering this text uh, with an invitation to understand how it connects to our practices and our performance. Uh, and, and then as it continues in this pericope, it provides us lots of opportunities uh, it uses the tongue again, and it makes emphasis on it being the smallest uh, of the organs and yet has such great power. And I, I can't help but read that and, and hear the encouragement and admonition that uh, the, the size uh, or the perceived impact of our actions don't always tell the whole story. Uh, just as one might discount the efficacy of the tongue or for good or bad. And the text is highlighting, hey, it's a lot more impactful than you may always give it credit for. Well, the same is true of our actions. Uh, it is encouraging us to say, hey, if, if you feel overwhelmed uh, and you see all of these practices around you that seem to be so harmful, don't discount the power of your own individual action. And so what could be more encouraging to a congregation to understand it can have an, a positive impact on its world, even though its impact may be perceived by others as small. So, so an immediate encouragement to reconsider uh, what good you can do uh, and that you ought to do something because both your, uh, the text seems to focus on the, the impact of rhetorical engagement, uh, but implicit in that is also an understanding of the impact of one's silence. So you get both the, hey, the, the tongue is playing a role for good or for bad. Well, if it is playing a role for good or bad, that also then probably means that our silence has equal impact. And again, mm. if I take that into the context of the church or in church, context of leadership, so what to what degree does our teaching on, our conversations on, our praxis around environment both say something and that our silence also says something, both of which are of consequence. So those are those are two places uh, where, and again, as we've already mentioned, the conclusion where it's telling me, if, if you have a set of beliefs, we ought to see some evidence of those beliefs in the actions, praxis, intention uh, of community. And so it, it provides another criteria for us to evaluate ourselves and to say, hey, what, to what degree is there alignment here? The, the open, the question that some might ask is whether or not the kinds of positive outcomes are also linked to some understanding of divine agency in the life of the individual. And that's a whole nother ball of wax. But I think at a very basic level, it is suggesting that our beliefs ought to have some product or some production or some intentionality in our lives. And you can still leave room for the perception of some engagement or some divine agency, um, but there, there is clearly a role for the individual or the community to play in fellowship with the environment. So let me, let me stop there. I, I think that what I appreciate about this is, as Dr. Davis has said, it doesn't jump out at you that this is a text that is commending some consideration of environment. And yet just resting with it for a short period of time, it became very evident to me that there are lots of challenges, questions and considerations as it relates to communities and their engagement with the world that are raised within this text. Mm.
I'm really drawn to two ideas that have come out of this conversation, although many great ideas have come out of this conversation. One is the idea of not just thinking of the tongue as our individual tongues, of thinking about our communal, the 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 voice, the word of of the community, and particularly the community being the church. And in that light, thinking about the writer saying that the tongue, the tongue's ability to set creation on fire in the context of the hottest summer on record and what we believe for many of us will be the coldest summer any of us will, that we will experience for the rest of our lives. What it means for the tongue to set the natural world on fire in that context. When we say that our actions aren't having that much of an impact, when we say that we'll find the technology to fix this, when we say that, oh, the world, the, the, the planet has gone through cycles of heating and cooling before, um, all of that is permission giving for, for the world being set on fire. Um, when we, when we spout a theology that says it's all going to burn anyway, we're all going to heaven. Um, we, our tongues are responsible for setting the world on fire. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, as leaders, we have a responsibility, um, as, as you both have said very eloquently, we have a responsibility to give a different message with our, with our collective tongue as the church, um, in light of, of the dire consequences that are in front of us, that our, our, our tongues and sometimes the silence of our tongues, um, has literally set the created world on fire. Um, I just, I'm, 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 I, I appreciate especially your, your bringing in that alternate translation, uh, Dr. Davis, because that's, that's, that's been sparking in my imagination since you said it, of what it means for literally for creation um, to be, to be set afire by the tongue. Um, what a powerful image that is. What, um, bonus question, what, uh, what encouragement or advice would you give to preachers, um, preaching this text, um, who are desiring to do so, um, through a creation justice lens? The encouragement that I think I and my students most need in order to preach in this area is that what you know in terms of the statistics or the science, what you know is enough. Mm. You don't need to get an advanced degree in, you know, ecology or, you know, climate science, whatever, in order to, you just cited, as I took it, Derek, something like oh, off the top of your head, a few things that we say, and we all understood what you were talking about. It's, you know, this isn't, this is not rocket science. <laughs> so, so you can open your mouth and say something responsible um, that you uh, can be quite certain is backed up. But your very first statement, the hottest summer on record and quite likely the coolest summer in time to come. Um, that's 
there's not a whole lot amongst, there's not a lot of serious challenge to that question or to that statement mm -hmm. out there. Um, and so something that has helped me is to realize that I don't have to get into the gray areas mm -hmm. in order to say something significant. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I would say is simply to reiterate what I said before, and that is that these texts were written by people who lived in a very different kind of culture than we do. Um, but they were drawing upon things that were matters of simple observation. Mm -hmm. in, I mean, I don't mean to suggest that there isn't a deep wisdom in forming these, but in terms of the sort of facts on the ground, they're simply calling upon what everybody knows. And so it is relatively easy once we commit ourselves to looking through their eyes to think about, okay, what does the world look like <laughs> in a land-based economy, for instance? Um, an economy where we live very close to the springs, the fig trees, mm. the forest that is under threat from uncontrolled fire, just and all of the beasts upon whom our lives directly depend. Just, it, it doesn't take a lot of historical knowledge to begin to let your imagination inhabit a different kind of world. Um, in which which breeds a kind of perception that the Bible takes for granted mm. and that and a kind of wisdom that the Bible assumes we are able to comprehend. Mm. Amen. But it does, one might say, um, it does require us to entertain the possibility that so much of what we take for granted with, in terms of our interaction with the created order, so much of that is from the perspective of this passage, unnatural. Mm. Um, unnatural because it's harmful because it cannot be perpetuated generation to generation mm. amen yeah I, I would um, I, as always I think Dr. Davis has really um, unearthed some of the wisdom of this text uh, I would in, you, you know, just a very language of the tongue setting the world on fire immediately provoked for me uh, what I think is a very human reaction. Hey, I'm not setting the world on fire. Uh, you, you mentioned the, this is the hottest and possibly the coldest summer we'll experience. Hey, and, and I, I'm not responsible for that. Uh, certainly my practices aren't setting the world on fire. Uh, and yet the text invites us to consider that even in our small ways and our small practices, we can be contributing positively or negatively to our impact on the world. And so that, that, that brings us into a real consideration of our role as individuals. Because again, what I'm grateful for is the text focuses on communal impact, but it, it, it also talks very personally about you know, the, the image of the individual's tongue and the impact that tongue can have. Well, that same imagery is present in our individual praxis, whether it's in our family and our homes. How is it that maybe I was, I have been giving myself a pass in places that the text is inviting me to think more deeply around my relationship with the world around and the impact uh, that I'm having. And again, I think that plays uh, 
there are two sides of that coin, both of which are beneficial to this conversation. Not only what am I doing that might be of detriment, but what I could be doing that could be of great benefit to my understanding of the world uh, and impact on the world. And uh, also Dr. Davis's observation that we often don't read the text through the lens of the writers of these texts and the understanding of what would have been second nature to them. We are often so far removed, but it again begs the question. So what is it about my understanding of the world that frustrates my ability to see some of the truths in this text mm. and to step into the shoes of the writer and to ask questions very similar to their worldview. Uh, and I, I think that's one of the things that we struggle with that not only are we far removed in terms of practice and time, but that we often don't even take the space to consider all of the ways in which uh, they had a view of the world and the environment and the community that differs from ours and how could we learn and benefit from just taking a, a few moments, not to rush through the text, not to make immediately the applications to the contemporary moment, but to make sure that we were understanding, here's what was true for this audience and how might it also be beneficial to those of us who are you know, centuries uh, and miles uh, removed from their, their context. So I, I would encourage the preachers to think about the fullness of this text uh, and all the ways in which it presents for us models of living and understanding that bring into a uh, conversation the, the community around us, the world around us, the environment, et cetera. Mm. Mm. Well, um, Dr. Davis, Dr. Lattimore, um, you um, have gotten to participate in the theme of this second year of Green Lectionary, which is why did Derek pick that text? Um, but uh, you have you have done so um, with with um, brilliance, imagination, creativity, and love, and I for that I am grateful. Um, so thank you both for your time, thank you for your energy, and thank you for your insights. This has been an, a, a gift uh, to be in conversation with you both. Thank you, and what a pleasure for me to be with you both. And absolutely likewise. Grateful um, both uh, Derek as well as being with uh, Dr. Davis. Thank you both for this time and, and all the questions you now leave me with to go back and sit <laughs> with this text even further. Thank you both. Thank you for joining us for the Green Lectionary Podcast. This episode was produced by Sprocket Wagner and the music was provided by Christian McIver. Please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and help us spread the word with a good review. And leave us a comment to let us know how you've used the show and how we can make it more useful for your ministry. You can learn more about this and other programs of Creation Justice Ministries at creationjustice.org. Our story comes alive within these pages For every time and place throughout the ages God speaks and is heard, and the enduring word calls us to care for our world as we share the love that can set creation free. Restoring the earth to wholeness, peace, and harmony. Let the songs of the water, land, and sky resound Cause together we're all bound Within these pages There's always new life to be found